Good evening and welcome to Beyond the Game, the show that examines sports, society, and social justice. I'm Zachary Draves. It has been said that it doesn't matter who wins or loses, it is how you play the game. The idea was that sport was for all to enjoy and to partake in, that if you want to play, you can play. Unfortunately, there have been micro, meso, and macro level forces that have weaponized sport as a way to deny an entire group from taking in the joys and pleasures that come with playing sports. I am talking about the push to banish transgender athletes from competing. Using pseudoscience, outdated gender stereotypes, and outright bigotry, politicians, commentators, and sport governing bodies have found nothing better to do during a global pandemic and economic catastrophe than to kick vulnerable people to the curb. The fact of the matter is that sports provide life-saving resources and outlets that enhance physical, emotional, psychological, and social attributes. Given that the transgender community is dealing with harassment, discrimination, and violence, Sports is one of many much needed safe spaces. And while it is important to highlight the plight of the trans community, it is also important to see trans people thriving, surviving, living, and breathing. The increased visibility of trans people in sports, pop culture, and holding the reins of political power is giving hope to so many looking for guidance. And one of those bright lights is Grace McKenzie. Grace has been a member of the San Francisco-based Golden Gate Women's Rugby Club for two years. When word got out this year that World Rugby, in conjunction with the UK-based anti-trans organization Fair Play for Women, proposed a ban on trans women players from competing, Grace launched a petition on change.org calling out World Rugby and encouraging others to stand up against this proposed ban. Since then, Grace has been on a tireless crusade to ensure that other trans athletes are included in rugby and other sports. We are thrilled to have Grace McKenzie join us this evening to talk about this campaign and so much more. Grace, welcome to Beyond the Game. Thanks, Zachary. I'm super happy to be here. Really excited to get into it. Awesome. Glad to hear it. So really, uh, just to kind of set the context for our audience, tell us a little bit about yourself and what got you involved in the sport of rugby. Yeah, so um, I'm Grace. I'm 27. As Zachary mentioned, I play rugby in San Francisco, California, here in the Bay Area. Had never played rugby before until about two years ago. I was actually recruited at a tech conference here for queer women and folks called Lesbians Who Tech and stepped out onto the pitch, picked up a rugby ball for the first time and absolutely fell in love with the sport. This is my first time playing on a gender affirming team as a trans woman, playing on a team of other women and, and folks who identify that way. And it's just been absolutely wonderful. That is that is really great to hear. And I was just going to ask you, uh, what has been um, the environment like playing on a women's rugby team in San Francisco, which historically has been seen as very LGBTQI plus friendly? I mean, it's been the epicenter for much of the LGBTQI plus movement. What's been the vibe uh, been like in San Francisco and being a part of this team? Yeah, so I think um, rugby, women's rugby in particular in the United States is a very queer friendly, LGBTQ friendly sport. And that goes sort of across the country, but especially in San Francisco in the epicenter of queer culture here in the US. Um, my team is such a welcoming environment. And, you know, since I joined, I've only been sort of welcomed with open arms and made to feel a part of the team in a really meaningful way. Um, and it's done wonders for me in terms of my confidence and feeling sort of supported and accepted through my transition journey. So I'm, I'm very fortunate to have access to the team. So when you got word of World Rugby's proposal to ban trans players from competing in rugby, what was going through your mind when you heard that? Yeah, so a little bit of history here I think would be helpful. Uh, World Rugby, before this sort of recent change in policy, had just reviewed their transgender inclusion policy in 2019. And they did that to match the International Olympic Committee's guidelines on inclusion for trans people in sports. 
So I found it very strange where in the beginning of this year, 2020 and around January, World Rugby announced that just eight or nine months after their previous review, they're going to be looking at their transgender inclusion guidelines once again. And for me, that raised some red flags because obviously as a trans person and somebody who plays sports, I've been privy to the pretty toxic conversation going around right now about trans people being included in sports. So I was initially suspicious. And then a few months later in the summer of this year, when they leaked to The Guardian, the fact that this ban was being proposed as a product of this working group, it took me totally off guard and uh, really frightened me because I thought I was going to lose access to a community that has really supported me in a meaningful way. And that support, I mean, I was reading um, an article that was posted back in August when uh, your petition circulated on social media and uh, you did an interview with Out Sports, which is a um, an outlet in conjunction with SB Nation, founded by the great uh, Sid Ziegler, that gives a platform to LGBTQI plus athletes. Um, you know, you talked about um, how the support that you have garnered um, from your teammates, your coaches, and then also from what I understand from USA Rugby, which is different than world rugby, mm -hmm. but the support uh, from USA Rugby was kind of set in stone from the get-go, is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm fortunate to play in a jurisdiction where our sort of national body for rugby, which is USA Rugby, has a more liberal interpretation of, or previously had a liberal interpretation of the World Rugby Guidelines on Transgender Inclusion. So my experience becoming eligible to play in the sport, I was simply in a conversation with my coaches, I came out to them, they went to the sort of league administrators for the region that I play in, and they cleared me to play the sport without any hassle, which was really wonderful and not something I think that athletes experience carte blanche who are, who are transgender identified. Usually folks experience more hostility or um, fear or sort of harassment as they're trying to enter the sporting world, which creates a lot of barriers, as you mentioned, to reaping the benefits that sports offer to everybody. But I was very fortunate to play here in San Francisco and under the USA Rugby umbrella, and I had no issues joining the team or participating in any way. That, that's really great to hear. And, you know, it's just really, it really contextualizes this whole, I, this whole issue because lately what we've been seeing, and it's particularly been surging over the last several years where we have seen uh, anti-trans specifically legislation being introduced at the state level and even at the federal level. I mean, this, this past week, uh, Hawaii Congresswoman uh, Tulsi Gabbard, who was a presidential candidate, introduced a bill, and I believe she's uh, making her way out of Congress. She introduced a bill that essentially is seeking to deny uh, trans women in particular um, from being able to participate in sports out of this pursuit of protecting women's sports, which, you know, there's this idea that, you know, if you deny other women participating in women's sports, that you're protecting women's sports. I mean, how, how, what kind of twisted irony is that? Yeah, I think the the guise under which these legislations are being proposed um, of Brown protecting women's sports, I think is a very paternalistic and sort of patriarchal approach to a problem that doesn't really exist. Mm -hmm. I always, when I'm having conversations about this issue, ask, you know, do these same people care about addressing the real problems that face women in sport, like sexual assault and harassment, underfunding, lack of access to safety equipment, trainers, you know, coaches, facilitators, that sort of thing, things that actually make sports dangerous for women or, or sort of unfair for women. And of course they don't. If you look at, you know, any of the organizations who are really crusading against trans people involved in sports, you can very clearly see that this is just the hot button issue people are talking about today. And at the end of the day, these groups just want to see rights for transgender Americans driven backwards. And it comes from a place of fear mongering, mongering sorry, comes from a place of transphobia. And it really has nothing to do with sports at the end of the day. It really doesn't. And even if you ask these people who are trying to take on this role of protecting the sanctity of women's sports, if you were, if you were to ask them who's their favorite female athlete or what, you know, if they, if they, if they're season ticket holders to WNBA games, or if they watch women's soccer regularly, like watch women's professional soccer, not just the world cup or the Olympics, right. Um, they don't really have anything to say because they're not really followers of women's sports. They're just acting out of what is convenient for them, politically speaking. 
Of course. I think it's partly politics. I think it's a big part due to misunderstanding, right? Mm -hmm. Like I think, you know, if you look at the statistics, less than one in four Americans know a transgender person personally within their life. And because of that, you know, it's very easy for stereotypes that are portrayed in the media about trans people, especially trans women, to take root and be the basis for a lot of these proposals. You know, most people who don't know trans people think of trans women as these, you know, hulking men in dresses, 280 80 pounds, 6'2", you know, massive, they're going to completely dominate the game. And, you know, there are folks who maybe are physically built that way. They fit in very well on a rugby pitch. But, you know, trans people, like all humans, come in all shapes and sizes, all skill levels, all levels of athletic athletic ability. And I think these sort of blanket bans or, or blanket prohibitions on our inclusion make very little sense in the context of how sport operates. Exactly. And to that point, um, there's no empirical data to back up their claim that trans women in particular, um, you know, have a quote, unfair advantage or a greater advantage um, than their cisgendered female uh, counterparts when it comes to participating in sports. And why do you think why do you think uh, this is now starting to be talked about? Why, why now? Why during this particular time? Yeah, so if you sort of zoom out and look at the, the larger, more macroscopic situation, this is part of a long-term political crusade from folks who are opposed to trans and queer rights. If you look 10, 15 years ago, ago, the conversation was all about marriage equality. It was about gay and lesbian people being allowed to get married or not, right? Social progress moved forward, you know, across the board, people accepted the fact that the gay people should be allowed to get married. So the conversation needed to shift somewhere else and it shifted to trans people. First, we had the bathroom bills, we had the locker room bills. You saw those, you know, three to five years ago coming out across the country and being shot down sort of one by one. The conversations moved on since we won that battle and now sports is the wedge that they're trying to use to drive back our protections. And there will be something else in the future once we move past the sporting issue. Uh, it's just frustrating that we have to sort of ha continue to have these conversations as we make social progress. Although in the end, history usually looks favorable um, on the people who are on the side of civil rights as opposed to opposed to them. Yes, history will tell the story. And in the end, those who are on the right side of history, ultimately, who champion equality and justice will will come out victorious. Um, and then, you know, like I said in the intro, um, you know, sports provides so many benefits, you know, physically, emotionally, psychologically, socially, you know, you build uh, connections, you, um, you know, tr transform, you translate your skills into um, excellence, you know, you thrive and, you know, you can channel all that energy into something that, you know, can lead you down a path of greatness and give you a status, you know what I mean? And so I, you touched upon it already at the beginning, you know, sort of talking about your journey into rugby, but what has sports meant to you throughout your life? Yeah, so I've played sports, specifically team sports for my entire life. I remember the first time I played sports, I was probably three, four years old, started out on the soccer pitch, learned how to ski, played basketball, and I played team sports continuously. It's been a very large part of my development as a person and has been the underpinning foundation for my confidence, for my ability to work in a team, for my leadership skills. You know, I've never played sport at the elite or international level, but it has never stopped me from looking for opportunities to participate in sport in my local community. For me, as a trans person, and when I first started my transition, honestly, I thought that sport was now lost to me and it wasn't something I would be able to participate in. And it was one of the many sacrifices that I deemed necessary to live as my authentic self and sort of move forward with my life. And I'm so fortunate that I found rugby when I did because the community really, really embraced me and told me, you have a place here. It doesn't matter what your identity is. It doesn't matter what your background is. As long as you're willing to go out there, give it your all, you know, get dirty, lay some hits, you're welcome on a rugby team. And to me, I think that's a really, really beautiful sentiment. Certainly. Um, who were uh, your role models? Uh, in terms of sporting or yeah. generally? Um, that's a really good question. I, I don't follow professional sports super extensively. I think now I really look up to folks like Sue Bird and the WNBA, in particular because of the fact that they combine athletic excellence with 
social justice and the fact that they see that they have a platform, that they have a stand that they can make on certain issues like Black Lives Matter or you know trans inclusion, what have you. And to me, that's impressive because not only are you fighting to be accepted as a woman in sport and carve out your own place in this very male dominated world, you're also looking down and seeing who else you can help, You know, who with less privilege than you, can you pull up that ladder? And I think that's really inspiring. Definitely. And um, I, I would imagine that you felt an immense sense of pride, um, this, especially this past year, um, this, this past summer, I should say, when um, Sue Bird and Megan Rapino and, you know, um, LeBron James and uh, so many other athletes, you know, who have already been outspoken on so many issues. But now the events of this summer really sort of elevated those platforms. And there was a real sense of urgency to speak out more and to do more. And if anything, COVID, the COVID crisis has really kind of forced athletes to sort of invest more time into, into the social activism. What, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I think it's one of the gifts that this pandemic has given us. There are a few of them <laughs> compared to the, what it's taken away. But I think it's really highlighted the inequities that exist in our society. And there have been people who have stepped up and, and made themselves known and are willing to be champions for these issues. And I think athletes have a very unique position in our society as folks who are usually heralded as role models with people that you know young folks look up to, where what they say matters and they can actually make social change. Change. So I think it's been very inspiring to see that happen. And I hope it's not something that goes away once, you know, seasons are back in swing and it's all about the game. Um, I want to see these conversations continue at the professional level. Definitely. And it's really trickled down from the professional level to the collegiate level, to the youth level, local level. You know, um, you, you can't escape it. And in a way that we haven't seen for so long. And a lot of times athletes uh, are now, especially nowadays, have been utilizing social media as a tool for their activism. And so kind of going back to um, the petition that you started uh, on change.org, um, what made you decide that change.org was the, was the platform to use to make your voice be heard? Yeah, I honestly, it was a gut reaction for me. I was shocked by the news that World Rugby was proposing this. And in that moment, I wanted to take back power in whatever way I could. And to me, a petition seemed like an easy way to get the message out there that something unjust was happening and seek support from folks around the world who I know stand with trans inclusion, especially in the women's rugby world, which is so queer. And for me, this, is, this just highlights how disconnected the decision makers at World Rugby actually are from the lived experience in the women's game. You know, if you look at the executive committee who made a decision on this, this ban, you know, it's overwhelmingly 95% white cis men. There's a single woman who's a part of that, uh, that organization who makes these decisions. And, you know, I've seen over 20,000 people across the world come out in support of that p petition, leaving hundreds of heartfelt comments about how they've played with trans women, they played against trans women, or they are trans women themselves, and how much rugby has given to them as a community. So um, to me, it was just a quick avenue to reach as many people as possible. And I think the real work is ongoing. You know, me and a number of other international rugby athletes around the world are still fighting this. They're still working to get world rugby to reverse their decision and sort of go back to how it was before in terms of inclusion. So it's a long game fight, I think, at this point. Yeah, and uh, not only have you used uh, change.org, but your, uh, your Instagram account um, and other social media outlets have really been uh, your megaphone to speak out and to uh, encourage others to um, engage with you and to support uh, other trans athletes in rugby and in all of sports. And then one of the things that um, World Rugby introduced when they were um, crafting this proposal um, was this idea or this intention of supposedly wanting to increase safety precautions? It, explain explain what that means, you know, under the guise of safety. Yeah. So 
Rugby is a, a really unique sport in the sense, okay, first and foremost, it's a contact sport, right? So there's going to be safety concerns when folks engage in, in contact or tackle each other. But the beautiful thing about rugby, knowing that you can have somebody who's 100 pounds and five foot five go up against somebody who's 300 pounds and six feet, just normally in a game that happens routinely, you and your coaching staff work so consistently on how to tackle safely, how to go to the ground effectively, how to avoid injury, that it's really baked into the game in the training side of things, not so much in terms of who's allowed to play and who's not. So when World Rugby came out and said, there's this huge safety issue we need to address, our initial reaction is the organizers to the opposition said, show us the data, show us injury rates where trans women participating in games with cis women lead to higher you know, levels of catastrophic injury than otherwise, and that data doesn't exist. World Rugby is, is very clearly trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist, and they're using safety as an argument as to why trans women shouldn't be included because the average person who doesn't understand the trans experience and doesn't understand the game of rugby can clomb onto these stereotypical ideas of what a trans woman looks like and how they're built and they can assume things that are really far from reality right and it's and it's relying on that pseudoscience and those these outdated gender stereotypes which you know you mentioned uh history at the beginning historically speaking these were the same sorts of the same type of rhetoric and the same talking points that were used, you know, 80 to 90 years ago to deny cis, cisgendered women from competing in sports, right? Yep. And we've seen this consistently, right? Um, sports have been used as a tool to marginalize people. In Canada, where I'm from, you know, indigenous people weren't allowed to play sports for so, so long because there was this scientific belief that their savagery as indigenous people would give them a competitive advantage against their white European counterparts. Obviously that has been disproved and obviously that was horrific to believe that in the first place, but it's a very similar vein of logic that's being used here. We're seen as other from, you know, cis women, unnatural in some way, and therefore we shouldn't be allowed to compete in the same category, which to me doesn't make sense as someone, especially who's five foot seven, 140 pounds, I'm nowhere near the largest person on my team, not the fastest, not the strongest, you know, I'm, I'm very middle of the pack. So I don't feel like I have an advantage or I'm somehow other than my teammates who are cis-identified. Right. And then to that point, you know, when we talk about, you know, unfair advantage or a quote unfair advantage, um, you know, we can we can apply that really to anybody. I mean, I can just share from my experience. You know, I grew up playing basketball. I played basketball from grade school up until um, my sophomore year of college. And people have told me that I'm pretty tall. I mean, I, I, I guess I'll take them at their word, but uh, I, but yeah, when I stepped onto the, onto the basketball court, you know, I could grab a rebound at a much greater advantage than a teammate of mine who was say, you know, five foot six, you know, um, but they're not going to say they're not going to deny anybody the right to play basketball under those circumstances, or even look at, you know, Michael Phelps, Michael Phelps, who yeah. is one of the most decorated athletes in history, you know, he has long arms and he has a greater lung capacity. No one says that he has an unfair advantage when it comes to swimming or Usain Bolt, who has long legs when it comes to yeah. track and field. No one will ever say that to a cis person. No, because at the end of the day, sport is fundamentally based on unfair competition. That's what makes sport exciting. You're selecting for folks who often have genetic anomalies that make them better at a specific sport. And that gets very clear at the high levels of sport. You know, it's a very easy way to understand the difference between how women's sports are treated in this regard and men's sports. You know, testosterone is always used as this bellwether for somebody's athletic ability. If you have high testosterone, you're going to be more athletic than if you have low testosterone. And that's the basis for separating men's and women's competitions, you see this policing of women's bodies and women's hormones levels in the women's game, like the horrible things that have gone on with Castro Semenya, yeah. where you never see men's rugby players or men's sports, you know, being tested for their testosterone levels, even though testosterone levels vary widely within men as well. You know, should men with low testosterone not be allowed to participate in the men's category because it's unsafe or, you know, they're going up against people who have an unfair advantage? Of course not, because at the end of the day, this isn't about sport. It's about policing people's bodies and policing their inclusion and policing their rights. 
Absolutely. And I'm so glad that you mentioned uh, Caster Semenya. And I want to encourage those who are watching to look up Caster Semenya and look at what she's had to endure uh, for several years uh, in terms of testosterone levels and the policing of her body and so forth. And she's now back and forth in you know, international court trying to fight for her place, her rightful place in sport. Um, and then really just sort of on that line of, you know, gender stereotypes, the way this whole conversation is being framed and then, you know, kind of speaking into that historical context of policing women's bodies, um, especially in sports, that helps, that can explain why um, this, these targeted pieces of legislation um, and these campaign efforts and these these attempts by sport governing bodies like World Rugby, they really single out trans women. Like you don't really hear uh, the same being said about trans men, nor should it be. Um, but it, it, it really goes along with the with that gender binary and those gender stereotypes. Yeah, and that's evident in World Rugby's ruling as well. Um, they did pass rules for trans men as well, but their rules for trans men effectively say, as long as you're willing to find a physician who will sign off on you waiving your liability or risk of injury playing in the men's game, you're more than welcome to play in the men's game, right? So if World Rugby was concerned about the safety of their athletes, would they really be allowing trans men who in their pseudoscientific belief are not capable of participating safely with the men's game to play when they waive their liability? That to me logically doesn't make sense, right? So at the end of the day, you see this ban on trans women not being about the sport itself, but being about you know trans misogyny, transphobia, holding people back from having equal rights and participation in the sport. Right. And then the greater pursuit for gender equality, um, it seems as though these efforts, you know, really are a divide and conquer strategy, you know, dividing cisgendered women who have been on the front lines for gender equality and then separating and dividing from trans women. Right. Or, and then we can also include gender non-binary, gender non-conforming mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, what do you think can be done to combat this divide and conquer strategy and to really sort of engage in a real collective solidarity? Yeah, so I think at the end of the day, it, it comes down to two things, and that's education and exposure, right? I mentioned already that, you know, one in four Americans have contact or, or know personally a transgender person, and that's just too few in terms of how many folks are identified as transgender in our country. By having more trans people visible in the media, you know, visible in sports, who actually have a platform and can sort of showcase what it's like to live a trans experience, I think that will build empathy and build bridges with cis folks who maybe misunderstand or have antiquated beliefs about what a trans person is or what they're capable of or what have you. And I think that's sort of the first step to getting people to really be open to the idea of trans folks participating fully in society. And the second is education, right? If people are fed incorrect facts or science that's not sort of academically um, reviewed or rigorous in that nature, um, you know, folks can build these misconceptions in their minds that allow them to describe discriminate against trans people, often from a place of well-meaning. You, know, you mentioned fair play for women, one of the many groups in the UK, unfortunately, who are cr crusading right now to hold back transgender rights and inclusion. And they do so on the, the pretense of protecting women's rights and, and allowing women to have you know, uh, equal rights in society and participation. But they do that at the sort of uh, detriment of trans people. And I think an education that, that pushes forth a much more inclusive idea of feminism will lead to greater outcomes for both cis women and trans women and everybody in between. Definitely. And um, I'm so glad. And then you, to that point of the statistic that you pointed out of the fact that one in four people do not know a trans person, um, you know, that continues along with the statistic that Laverne Cox, the famous uh, trans uh, actress and activist, said in the amazing documentary Disclosure, which I would encourage all of you to watch um, to the audience, uh, Disclosure, which is on Netflix, that really breaks down uh, the history of trans representation in media and popular culture and so forth. And it really seems like, you know, in these spaces, in media, in pop culture, in sports, that is where 
um, we're seeing this surge of trans visibility in a way that we haven't seen before. Did you ever think that you would see this level of visibility in your lifetime? No, honestly, as somebody who grew up in the closet for, you know, 23 years living in a small conservative town in Canada, not having the language to describe my experience, not having role models to look up to, I'm so thankful that the next generation of, of trans kids, trans people have these figures who are shown in a positive light, because trans people have been in the media for decades, but the unfortunate thing is that we've been shown in such negative lights often as you know serial predators or psychopaths you think of silence of the lambs you think of ace ventura right if you're growing up seeing those representations of how you feel inside it does wonders on somebody's mental health and their development in a negative way whereas now kids who are coming up can see folks like laverne cox see folks you know who are in the media you know elliot page etc who give a positive representation for our community and show trans kids that it's okay to be who you are and live, you know, an authentic life. And I think that's a really priceless gift. Right. And then with the going along that theme of history, it just seems like now we're starting to learn more about the LGBTQ plus movement, um, generally speaking, and then also in the world of sports, where now you're starting to learn more about Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, who were the ones who were at Stonewall uh, in June of 1969. And really, if it weren't for them who led the charge that night at Stonewall, there wouldn't be uh, an LGBTQ plus movement. And then when you look at sports and you see, you know, the first person that comes to mind is Renee Richards. You know, that's who we historically have heard of um, when it comes to um, trans athletes or the first well-known trans athlete to compete openly in sports. Um, what does that mean for you, kind of going along with that theme, what does it mean for you now that people are starting to learn more about the history uh, of trans people and, tr and the contributions of trans people to society? Uh, it's super important. I think both for trans people themselves to know their history and be proud of, of where our community has come from, but more importantly for non-trans folks to understand first and foremost that this isn't a new thing. Trans people aren't a fad. We have been here for millennia, you know, in all cultures around the world. It's not something that's just happening now, uh, which is why the moral panic, especially in the UK around trans people is so bizarre to me. But I think um, in general, the gift of, of having folks in the spotlight who are trans, again, it, it plays into that visibility, it plays into that education, it normalizes our existence, and it hopefully sets out a foundation for folks who aren't trans to build empathy and be able to understand what we go through. Right. And then, you know, sort of talking about, as I said at the beginning, of the importance of, you know, acknowledging the plight of the trans community when it comes to issues of discrimination. We're seeing, you know, we've seen over the last several years, rights and protections being rolled back in healthcare, education, the military, and then also um, these bills that are being introduced by people like Tulsi Gabbard or Kelly Loeffler out in Georgia, um, and then also in states like Idaho. Um, and then you see um, really the, the scourge of violence that has been ongoing for some time where particularly uh, trans women of color have been murdered and have been killed at an alarming rate. You know, already, according to the Human Rights Campaign, 40 trans and gender nonconforming uh, folks have been killed, most of them black and brown in 2020 alone. So it's important to acknowledge that plight and to address it and then also and also celebrate the visibility and celebrating the fact that trans people are here and they're thriving and they're succeeding. You know, you are a great example of that. Here you are, you are succeeding, you are thriving and you are, you know, staying living your truth and being true to yourself and then you know creating platform creating a platform for yourself and you are opening doors for others to follow and that's why your visibility matters and laverne cox visibility matters and then if we can talk about more trans athletes you know we can andrea yearwood and terry miller and mm -hmm. teffler and we can go down the list that's why, especially during this time and forever, but especially during this time, that's why the visibility of athletes like yourself matters so much. Mm -hmm. And it's it's unfortunate that it is a double-edged sword, right? When you, you talk about folks who are 
willing to put themselves out there and be in the spotlight, you know, me in a very small microcosmic way with this rugby issue. We have received hate messages from folks, you know, because I've appeared in, in news articles sort of around the world. Um, you know, the comments on some of these articles calling into question my character or who I am as a person, it's exhausting and it wears you down. But at the end of the day, the trans community is very small and uh, we are a marginalized group of people. And if we're not willing to fight for our own rights, it's hard for me to know who would be willing to. So um, for better or for worse, I think folks need to be activists in addition to being athletes, in addition to being professionals, in addition to being parents, et cetera. Uh, that's just sort of the reality that trans people live in today. So how can people um, support you and support the work that you're doing and then also to educate themselves about um, engage about supporting trans about supporting trans athletes. Yeah, so there's there's so many ways that you can help, right? If you're an athlete yourself, especially somebody who, you know, plays community sports, if you uh, know what the sort of trans inclusion policy is for your organization, and it's not one that's open and sort of welcoming, that's something that you can actually push back on. You can write to the people who, you know, administer your leagues or facilitate them and ask them to review their policies, ask them to open the doors to trans athletes. If you encounter trans teammates, people trying to join your team or otherwise, be that welcoming support for them, be that olive branch, help them feel like they're a part of the team. Uh, more generally, if you're not in the athletic space, you know, follow trans educators and communicators and sort of uh, artists and activists online on social media. There's so many on Instagram and otherwise that go out of their way to educate the general pop, uh, population on trans issues, find them and follow them. And lastly, you know, consider giving money to organizations like the ACLU or Lambda Legal, folks who are fighting the battles in the courts for trans people every day, ensuring that our rights and protections aren't rolled back and they continue to move forward as we progress as a society. And speaking of organizations, uh, Athlete Ally, which is a well-known uh, LGBTQ plus uh, organization that fights for LGBTQ athletes um, and also um, participation for LGBTQ athletes in sports, they have been actively involved in pushing back against these types of anti-trans legislation. And they were, they rallied behind you and uh, your campaign, the petition, and then also the hashtag rugby for all. Um, what did that mean to you to have an organization like Athlete Ally come to your defense? It was so wonderful because it made me feel like I wasn't alone in this fight and it wasn't just trans people fighting for their rights and freedoms. There are people who care about us as a community and want to see us included and, and sort of involved in sports. And the folks at Athlete Ally and Lieberman, et cetera, you know, are just such wonderful individuals and they're so keyed into the conversations that are going on, working to come up with draft policies to support organizations who don't have the resources to build them themselves and just empowering athletes to be their authentic selves and use their platforms to spread, you know, the word about inclusion and, and advocacy and sort of ensuring that that in acceptance is sort of something for all people in sports. Um, they're just a wonderful organization. I've been really happy to work with them. Right, absolutely. And really, you know, kind of speak, going back to that sort of historical reference, you know, in the beginning of, you know, organizations like Athlete Ally or the You Can Play Project, and uh, we'll give them a shout out later on. Um, but, uh, you know, those organizations along with the movement as a whole, was really centered on, you know, rights and opportunities for gays and lesbians specifically, as well as, you know, mm -hmm. bisexual folks. Um, and so to have them come to fruition and really, you know, be active and supporting you and supporting other trans athletes and fighting back against these pieces of legislation, which we already talked about at the end of the day, does more, does tremendous harm. Um, you know, that really shows that we've come a long way and then at the same time, acknowledging that there's so much more work that needs to be done. Exactly, right? And um, it always amazes to me, I don't work in the nonprofit world, but it amazes me that there are people who dedicate their whole professional lives to fighting on behalf of underprivileged or marginalized people. It's it's really, really heartwarming and very noble in my mind. And I think it would be much harder for us to make the progress that we do without those really tireless individuals who work on our behalf. Um, and I'm just thankful that they're in our corner. So where do you where do you go from here as far as your rugby career is concerned? 
Uh, well, I'm not going to stop playing rugby. Um, luckily, USA Rugby and, and many other rugby nations around the world have broken with World Rugby's guidance and said we're not going to implement this ban on our home turf. So as soon as I'm able to get back on the pitch, I will be playing rugby again. I intend to continue to volunteer for my rugby team. I was a part of the executive committee this past season. I was in charge of recruitment and our rookie uh, sort of coordination program. And I want to continue to do work like that within my local community. And I think, as I mentioned, we're still fighting this, this ruling from World Rugby. You know, they have made it clear that they're willing to fund research that is potentially uh, able to refute some of the claims that they're making. We've had some researchers like Joanna Hoffman, a really wonderful trans-identified researcher, submit a proposal to work on um, studies that actually involve trans athletes. Uh, to my knowledge, she hasn't heard anything back from World Rugby yet, so we're going to be putting pressure on them to live up to their promise and actually fund that research. And, you know, we're going to be talking to other people who are connected to World Rugby, their sponsors, you you know, organizers, for example, of the World Cup that's happening in New Zealand next year. It's uh, set to be the first openly transphobic international sporting event in the world. We want to make it known to the people of New Zealand that that is the case and that, you know, this is something they should be upset about. So stay tuned for sure. We're not going away and we're going to get louder as time goes on. That is that is really incredible to hear that you are staying in the game, you know, both on the pitch and off the pitch, you know, and uh and again, you know, your visibility matters, uh, the fact that you are succeeding and the fact that you are using your platform and living your truth is very, very important. And so um, I just have two more questions for you before we wrap up. First and foremost, what would your message be to um, other tra to trans youth in particular who want to engage in sports, but maybe afraid to engage in sports because of you know, potential backlash, what would your message be to them? Yeah, I, I the only message I can say is, is you have to, you have to fight, <laughs> you have to get out there, you have to do the hard things, you have to put yourself out there. And I think the easiest way to make that more accessible or something that is less frightening is to find those allies who are willing to stand beside you and, and support you and amplify your voice. At the end of the day, it's going to be you out in the spotlight who's fighting to make that change. And that's how it has been for our community for so long. But there are people out there who side with you, who care about you, who want to see you included. And if you find them, your voice will always be louder. And then how can people um, follow you, follow your career, follow the work that you're doing? What outlets can they engage with? Yeah, so um, you can obviously follow me on Instagram. I know that's been shared a couple times here. I talk openly about my experience as a trans person, both in sports and otherwise. Uh, we also run an Instagram account called Rugby for All, and that's where we do a lot of our official campaigning against this World Rugby ban. So you can follow us there for up-to-date news on what we're doing and how we're putting pressure on World Rugby. Um, otherwise, organizations like Athlete Ally, you know, the ACLU, like I mentioned, Lambda Legal, who are at the forefront of these fights, stay sort of in tune with what they're working on because they really are um, crusading for us for inclusion and acceptance and you know fighting back against discrimination and those are probably the best ways to stay involved right now well grace mckenzie it has been such a thrill and such an honor to talk with you this evening and to hear about the work that you've been doing um and again you know i've already said it before but i'll say it again uh the fact that you are Stay living your truth and that you are competing in your truth and that you are really you are really a legend in your own in your in your own time and so you are you are saving lives and you are opening doors for so many and so it's a real honor to to talk with you keep up the good work and we will be following you every step of the way and thank you so much for being on beyond the game this evening i appreciate that thank you for having me zachary you're very welcome, Grace. Our thanks to Grace McKenzie. And before we go, let us remind you that if you like to support Grace and other trans athletes, as she mentioned, uh, you can go and sign the change.org petition. And then you can also show your support uh, for, the rug for the Rugby for All campaign. Furthermore, please support organizations like Athlete Ally and the You Can Play Project that advocate for LGBTQI plus equality in sports. And I really hope that this show educated you on the importance of true inclusion and fairness and living up to those true principles of sport. If you want to play, you can play. 
as well as acknowledging the need for collective solidarity and that these broader struggles for social justice require us all to stick together, that the fight for justice for the trans community is in sync with the fight for, say, racial and gender justice. And we cannot afford to be caught up in the oppression Olympics where we are in competition with one another. And I'll close with a quote from Keith Boykin, who is a famous African-American LGBTQ plus activist and commentator. He said, it doesn't matter which group was first oppressed, which group is most oppressed, or whether they are identically oppressed. What matters is that no group of people should be oppressed. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to Nuts and Bolts Sports. I'm Zachary Draves, and on behalf of the NBS team, good night and happy holidays.